All right. So 604, we've got over 40 people here now, and I'm sure that number will keep on going up. Um, I just want to say, hey, I'm, I'm Chad Pritchard, uh, the organizer of the Columbia Basin Geologic Society. Help Andy and I restarted a couple of years ago. Um, and then with COVID, we moved on to the Zoom platform, merged with uh, EW Geology, Eastern Washington University Geology. Um, it was a pretty easy merge since I'm the chair of the department. So um, we can use this wonderful Zoom interface right here and have these great talks. I'd like to thank um, Tom Broker, who talked last time, and that talk is now available on the YouTube channel for EW Geology Rocks. I can put that in the, the chat menu a little bit later. Um, just Google EW Geology. It also has Scott Burns' talk on there, and um, yeah, potentially future ones too. Um, today, we are lucky enough to have Spokane famous geologist, um, Andy Buddington, uh, came out of UW, Western Washington, has worked all along the Western U.S., maybe a little bit in Canada too, eh? Alaska. Oh, just Alaska. Okay. I don't know how that works. Um, for Kaminko. And then has been teaching at, at uh, Spokane Community College for a while now. And uh, really my inspiration to sort of start working more with the community and having talks like this. When I first moved to Spokane, Andy was the man for these talks and still is. Um, and so I'm just very excited to have Andy here talking about something that I, I find extremely fascinating myself, um, uh, these older rocks that we find. And so we're going to talk, let Andy go on, going below the belt, belt super group of the Priest River Complex. Thank you very much, Andy. Whoa. Thanks, Chad. Uh, thanks for taking over the, the baton for CBGS and keeping this going. It's, uh, it's pretty critical, I think, that we have a healthy local geologic society considering the, A, our location in the world, awesome geology. B, we have uh, a long-lived uh, history with mining, the Bureau of Mines, and so forth. So thanks for keeping this going, Chad, and getting it healthy again. Okay, so uh, today, tonight, I'm going to talk about, I'm going to break it into three parts. I'm going to do a review of the geology over at Cougar Gulch, just south of Coeur d'Alene, on the west side of the lake. I gave a talk several years ago on the Cougar Gulch geology, so I'm going to try to move through that somewhat rapidly. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the new work and dates we have from up near Priest River and uh, the implications those dates and the geology have. And then I'm going to finish up by comparing the Paleo Proterozoic rocks at Cougar Gulch and in the Priest River complex, along with the Clearwater complex, by the way, to Paleo Proterozoic rocks in East Antarctica, and maybe address the second part of uh, the talk's title. So, a quick review uh, we're going to be mainly here in the Priest River complex, one of the many metamorphic complexes of the Pacific Northwest. Um, it is closely linked, at least as far as rock types for the most part, and the ages of the rocks to the Clearwater complex directly to the southeast. So I'm going to focus mostly on these rocks here, but I will uh, mention some of the work that's been done in the Clearwater by Jeff Revoort and his students down at WSU. So I just want to mention that um, some of the work that's been done on the basement rocks in the Priest River complex, uh, Dowdy and others really kicked it off in 1998 with his great paper that uh, not only explained the complexities of the core complex itself, but talked about these uh, before unknown uh, Archean aged rocks up in the Priest River area and also Paleoproterozoic rocks. Dowdy and Chamberlain did uh, a more detailed study in 2008, uh, age dating uh, various rocks, including the uh, uh, amphibolites in the Hauser Lake Nice, tying those to the Moye Sills. Uh, Fisher and others, Chris Fisher was a student of Jeff Revoort. Uh, they did some great work in 2014 where they presented uh, radiometric age dates on zircons. And then 
Da Wang did his master's thesis on the rocks I'm going to be talking about today, where he presented um, numerous uh, age dates on uh, the not only the Paleoproterozoic, but the Archean rocks. We did mapping and presented some interesting correlations and implications in a field guide, GSA field guide in 2016. Revort and others put out a great paper in 2015 that kind of summarizes not only the Priest River, but also the Clearwater complex rocks and their ages and compares those to other uh, old rocks in the Pacific Northwest. And we recently did uh, a study on some rocks up in the Priest River area that I'll talk about. That's from our uh, work in 2019. So for those of you that aren't familiar with core complexes, here's a simple over overview. In the early days, they were called nice domes because of their domal structure, often cored by high-grade gneisses. So we have this domal or antiformal infrastructure with uh, superstructure rocks that are either weakly metamorphosed or unmetamorphosed that have detached and slid off along detachment and intervening myelinitic rocks between the upper part uh, of the infrastructure and the superstructure. In this talk, we're going to go below the belt, the uh, the uh, belt supergroup. In fact, we're going to go below the myelinite zone itself. Most of the myelinite zone of the Spokane Dome or Priest River Complex is made up of Hauser Lake Nice, which has been well correlated with the lower belt Pritchard formation. We're going to go below that and look at the crystal basement rocks in the infrastructure. So we're going to go to two areas. We're going to first look at these rocks down here in the south at Cougar Gulch. And then we'll go up and look at some old basement rocks that are exposed up here just south of the little town of Priest River that Dowdy described in his 98 paper as well as the 2008 paper. Aerial view of Lake Coeur d'Alene looking north. There's Coeur d'Alene itself, the resort. There's Tubbs Hill and the clouds with the Purcell Trench Fault going to the north up through the Raftrum Prairie, Round Mountain with its beautiful SC Myelonites off there on the left. So everything here on the right or the east side is part of the superstructure that is slid off of the uplifted domal infrastructure here. And we're gonna look at these rocks uh, around the Cougar Bay area to the south, almost as far as Rockford. Just to show that we did indeed get out in the field and do some mapping, here's our geologic map from 2016. And everything within this thin band is uh, part of these exposed paleoproterozoic orthonices, which we call the Cougar Gulch orthonices. The thin, darkish band is a clean, Quartzite, and everything outside of that is part of the Hauser Lake Nice. In essence, it's a plunging antiform. It's way more complex than that. It's a folded fold with lots of folds, in fact. Complex map pattern, but we think we got the basics. Again, from Cougar Bay here in the north, down almost as far as Rockford Bay in the south, and this is all the South Fork of Mica Creek. 95 runs right through here. Uh, rich gashing under Jeff Vervoort got it all going back in the early 2000s where he dated some orthonices at Mica Hill that had been mapped as Cenozoic, or excuse me, Mesozoic. And he came back with age dates of 1.85, 1.86, which got everybody very excited. Da Wang did his master's thesis, so these black dots are sample sites that he did uranium lead dating on the various rocks and detrital zircon dating on the quartzite. So some uh, great data points here. 
Here's a simplified strat sections. I'd like you to focus on the one on the left. We'll get to the one on the right later. And from the top down, we start out in the Hauser Lake Nice, which along Highway 95, just adjacent to Cougar Bay, is myelinatized with beautiful lineations. Uh, there are amphibolites in that Hauser Lake Nice. They've been dated at 1.48, so a beautiful correlation to lower belt Pritchard formation. Below that is a quartzite unit. It's graphitic, very, very clean. And below that is the Cougar Gulch orthonice sequence. The Cougar Gulch Nice has numerous amphibolite inclusions, which I'll talk about. In fact, it has three different types which we'll talk about. So technically, we're going below the belt and ultimately down into the crystalline basement. So here's our Hauser Lake Nice right off of Highway 95, right across from Cougar Bay. It's classic Hauser Lake Nice, rusty weathering, myelinatized, pegmatites, budins, and amphibolites. Here's a close-up of Hauser Lake Nice with the dominant mineral assemblage, sillimanite, K-feldspar, biotite, garnet, and locally kyanite. So high-grade upper amphibolite facies metamorphism. Okay, that's enough of the Hauser Lake. We're going to now go down into the Razorback Quartzite, which Ted being from Arkansas, and we mapped the type locality up on Red Hog Ridge, he was insistent that it had to be called the Razorback. So there it is. It outcrops along the lake, as well as up along Red Hog Ridge and around on the backside of the South Fork of Micah Creek. It's a beautiful, clean, bedded quartzite. In places, it's lineated, but not real strong, if any, myelinites. Um, we're basically getting out of the myelinite zone itself. Here, it's dipping gently to the east into Lake Coeur d'Alene. A close-up of the quartzite. It's an ortho quartzite. It has a very low percentage of feldspar, unlike Pritchard quartzites, which have variable and moderate amounts of feldspar. This also contains um, accessory amounts of graphite, which as we'll see, the gold cup up in Priest River does also. So very clean graphite bearing ortho quartzite. Here's a view of the Razorback again. Uh, in places, it can be thinly bedded with partings that are rich in muscovite, which were probably silty inner beds. But for the most part, it's a very clean quartzite. And as luck would have it, we think we nailed the contact, but of course they had to build a million dollar plus lake mansion right on the contact. And those folks don't take kindly to people like us wandering around. So we never got to actually see an outcropping of the contact between the Razorback and the Hauser Lake, but we're assuming it's an unconformable contact. Here's detrital zircon data that Da Wang did, did in, uh, did in his thesis. On the left are samples of Razorback quartzite, two of them that Da did detrital zircons on. Then the gold cup quartzite that Dowdy and Chamberlain published in 2008. We compared that to the Nyhart formation over in Montana. On the right are Pritchard quartzites. One of the key things we wanted to determine was, was this quartzite a Pritchard quartzite or was it a uh, sub-belt quartzite? So, uh, Notice two things with the Razorback Gold Cup Nyhart here. Two key things. The youngest aged 
detrital zircons out of the Razorback are 1.73 billion. Okay. There is a major peak at 1860, another significant peak at 2650, and a spattering of really old 3200 zircons. So probably North American zircons from the craton, but this key 1.73 being the youngest. Compare that to the Hauser Lake, the youngest is 1.46. The bulk of the Hauser Lake zircons cluster at 1600, which of course you know is the age range of the North American magmatic gap that Steve talked about last spring. There's also a spattering of 1458 and 2884 zircons in the Hauser Lake. So two different young ages or youngest detrital ages would suggest these are not the same. And secondly, the Razorback maximum depositional age has to be younger than 1.73 or thereabouts. We're kind of guessing somewhere between 1.6 and 1.7. Okay, now we're going to go down into the crystalline basement and look at the orthonysis and the amphibolites. Here's a typical outcrop, and I'll say there aren't a lot. The exposure is pretty poor throughout most of the area, but if you work hard, you can find some decent exposures. Well foliated. Some places very homogeneous, other places quite heterogeneous. Here's a close-up of one of the samples down near Mica Creek. It's a granodiuretic orthonice. For those of you that aren't familiar with the nice vocabulary, of course, ortho means igneous. So these are igneous-derived nices versus paranices, which are sedimentary. So this was once a granodiorite in its earlier life, around 1.87 billion years old. It's a kind of megachristic granodiorite, the dominant assemblage, plage, orthoclase, quartz, amphibole, and biotite, along with magnetite and titanite. This is the second mappable unit that we identified that we call the Kid Creek orthonice. It dated at 1.87 billion. It ranges from a tonalite to a granodiorite. I should mention the Cougar Gulch orthonices range from granodiorites to monzonites to true granites, whereas the Kid Creek is more case bar poor and plage rich. The Kid Creek doesn't have any magnetite and we did not identify any hornblende. It's biotite rich. And it's also uniformly or homogeneously medium grain. Here are the dates that Da produced in his master's thesis and the orthonices are all plotted here. Notice very good robust ages, all clustering between about 1.86 to 1.87. I will also point out this really old age up here. This is the amphibolite that, uh, that Da dated, and we'll look at that next. So this is the Archean amphibolite that Da sampled very close to Highway 95 there at the start of Cougar Gulch Road. It occurs as a large inclusion within the Cougar Gulch orthonice. And we're interpreting it as a piece of basement that got slivered off and tectonically interleaved within the um, Cougar Gulch orthonice. Uh, another possibility is that it's just a big stoped block of Archean country rock. 
dated at uh, 2.65 with a dominant assemblage, a horn blend plagioclase with a lot of titanite, a little bit of biotite and quartz. There are numerous occurrences of amphibolites throughout the area. This is from the outcrop up at Mica Summit before you go over the hill to Mica Flats. And here we have the Cougar Gulch Orthonysis Country Rock. There's a contact down at the bottom with a cyanogranite, which is the same age, about 1.86 as the Orthonice. And here are these amphibolite inclusions uh, floating within the Cougar Gulch Orthonice. Now, all the Orthonices all look the same, medium, grain, foliated, just like that picture. You really can't tell one from the other. But when you do geochemistry on them, three defined groups jump out. And this is uh, a rare earth element plot showing the trace element, rare earth elements for the orthonices. And notice we have three distinct groups. Group one are the Archean orthonices, moderately steep, enriched in light rare earths with a very defined europium anomaly. Kind of typical of arc-like basalts. Okay, and for those of you that aren't familiar with amphibolites, most form from metamorphosing basalts or basaltic andesites. So we interpret that as a, an igneous amphibolite, probably a basalt in its earlier life. The second major group are these samples, group two, which we correlate directly with the amphibolites in the Hauser Lake Nice, the so-called Moye Sill, uh, amphibolites. They correlate beautifully with samples we've collected from the Liberty Lake area. And then the third group, this group three, we have no date on and it has a very distinctly different rare earth pattern with a slightly positive pattern with either no europium anomaly or a very weak europium anomaly. So geochemistry does matter. In this case, we can identify the different amphibolites, which is kind of cool. But I want to focus now on the orthonices and some key questions that we tried to, or at least I tried to answer. Ted could care less about this stuff, <laughs> but he's more into structure and fabrics and so forth. I like to look into the chemistry. I wanted to kind of characterize these orthonices. What kind of granites are they and what kind of tectonic setting did they form in this beautiful deformed monzo granite? Orthonice. So they're all calc alkaline. They're I type granites. They have a moderately wide range of silicon dioxide contents. They're metal luminous to weakly paraluminous. They are magnesian in character to very weakly ferroin. Okay. What does that mean? Well, these are characteristic of subduction, continental arc type granites, kind of like Cordieran granites, if you will. They have very defined and consistent major element trends, suggesting they have not been affected too much by metamorphism, at least uh, major and trace element chemistry hasn't been disrupted by metamorphism, which is nice. And we see these two distinct groups chemically as we did in the hand samples that I showed earlier, the ortho, uh, the um, Cougar Gulch orthonice and the Kid Creek orthonice. So some quick geochem diagrams. You saw these if you were at my talk a few years ago. Clearly these are calc alkaline way over on the alkali side. The two groups, the blacks are the Kid Creek, the blues are the Cougar Gulch and I've been waffling to create a third group called the Lofts Bay or Orthonice, but I just am not committed yet to say it's a definitely a third group. Notice they're mostly metaluminous. They plot strongly in the I-type granite field. These are not S-types that form from metamorphism 
of sedimentary hosts or, or uh, parents. These are not mantle, purely mantle derived granites like you might see in an ocean ocean arc system. These are more like continental arc granites. As I mentioned, magnesium to weakly ferroin. So clearly I type, not A type. When we look at the trace element plots, very distinctive trends. They follow each other very nicely, very tight. Two key things to notice here, a moderately steep negative trend with enriched large ion, large ion lithophiles, okay? And two distinctive trends, or at least one very important one with niobium tantalum uh, negative anomalies, which are very characteristic of archetype subduction generated granites. The Kid Creek unit typically runs with lower concentrations of both large ion lithophile elements as well as high field strength elements. The rare earth plots, the same nice tight groupings, again enriched in the light rare earths, moderately steep negative trend to depleted heavy rare earths with the Kid Creek unit showing no negative europium anomaly, suggesting either uh, no plagioclase differentiation or plage in the, in the source areas, but very low heavy rare earths, which are common to Proterozoic and Archean tonal itrongemite granodiorite terrains or to modern atacites, which have been shown pretty conclusively to form in arc type subduction environments. All the discrimination plots, these are Pierce plots, which of course you have to be very careful with, but they all show a strong affinity to volcanic arc granites, especially the Kid Creek unit. So, Pretty clearly, these were generated in some sort of subduction, continental vol volcanic arc type environment. This is initial epsilon hafnium data uh, from zircons that Da Wang did in his thesis. And the epsilon hafnium data from zircons has become a pretty important tool for petrologists and for geologists trying to reconstruct these ancient terrains. And the bottom line here is that the hafnium isotopes can kind of fingerprint, if you will, the, the zircons and where and how they form. They don't just give, you know, an age, but they can help fingerprint the source area and the kind of setting. And so, Notice that we see two distinct groupings again with the Kid Creek unit showing a much greater mantle component versus the Cougar Gulch orthonice, which shows a more significant crustal component. In Da's thesis, he argued that both units formed from relatively depleted mantle, which would be typical of a mantle wedge and subduction zone, with one unit having very little interaction with the overlying continental crust, and the other unit, the Cougar Gulch orthonice unit, having interaction and partially melting the uh, continental crust as it was rising up in the subduction setting. So those are the rocks at Cougar Gulch. We're now gonna go north up here to Priest River and look at some of the rocks up there. So I'm gonna talk about this side of the strat diagram. Again, Hauser Lake Nice, just like down at Cougar Gulch. One difference is there's that pesky occurrence of the Laclede Augen Nice within the Hauser Lake Nice. The Laclede has been well dated at 1.58 billion. So how do you get a 
1.58 billion orthonice into a 1.47 billion uh, paranice. Well, you tectonically emplace it, and the field relations show that quite well. Below the Hauser Lake is the Gold Cup quartzite of Dowdy. It is graphitic and it's very clean. And below that is the Ponderé gneiss, a 2.65 billion year old granitic gneiss. And there are amphibolite inclusions within that as well. So here's the Ponderé gneiss. Dowdy uh, dated that. And it came back a good solid 2.65 billion years old. And I looked at it in thin section, and it ranges from being granodiuretic to tonalitic in composition. We also did geochemistry on it and showing the granodiuretic to tonalitic composition. These are the amphibolite inclusions. Okay. When Ted said, hey, you should take a look at the amphibolite inclusions up there. I said, wow, you have amphibolite inclusions in a 2.65 billion year old orthonice. That's, that's pretty exciting. A, we have these amphibolites down at Cougar Gulch, and maybe these will correlate with the infamous group three, and maybe they're even older than 2.65, which had not been reported to this point. So we sampled them. And we ran them for geochemistry, and Da Wang did the uranium lead dating on zircons. Here are the, some of the geochemistry. These are the inclusions from Priest River. They range from basaltic to basaltic andesite, which is kind of interesting. They are calc alkaline, which is also very interesting. These are clearly not foliatic basalts. Calc alkaline basalts and basaltic andesites are typically associated with subduction generated basaltic sequences. So clearly they have more of a correlation, at least from the preliminary geochem, to the really old Archean orthonices that we looked at down at Cougar Gulch. They're not group three, they're not Moye sill type. Here's some of the geochem. Notice, not as steep a trace element plot, but still enriched on the incompatible light ion with the file side of things. Somewhat depleted on the high field strength, but again, a negative niobium tantalum uh, anomaly, suggesting that indeed these could be or likely subduction arc related. Here's the rare earth data. And um, I'm particularly excited about the geochem plot because it shows a, a nice um, characteristic trend. And I plotted the Ponderay nice on there too. So whether or not these were comagmatic in the same system as the old Archean Ponderay nice or not, uh, we didn't know until we got the dates back. So it was pretty exciting. But wah, 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 wah. These were not Archean in age or older. But interestingly enough, the amphibolites dated at 1.86 paleoproterozoic, the same age as the Orthonice is down at Cougar Gulch. That was pretty exciting. Here's the basaltic andesite two trends. These are inherited, which go up to 2.5, 2.6. But the crystallization age for that basaltic andesite is around 1.84. So interestingly enough, these basaltic andesites correlate with the granitic orthonices um, these, these amphibolites uh, correlate with the granitic orthonices down at Cougar Gulch. So we think they're part of that paleoproterozoic 
igneous subduction generated arc, continental arc environment. So what we're, what are we looking at during Paleoproterozoic time? Well, not for sure, but maybe something like this. Oh, and, I, and by the way, I should mention down in the clear water, the 1.86 orthonices in the clear water plot very consistently with the 1.86 rocks up here. So we think it is some kind of continental arc convergent margin setting during the Paleo Proterozoic 1.86 billion years ago. So to summarize the rocks from Cougar Gulch and Priest River, we had intrusion of granites and basalts into 2.65 billion year old crust. Laurentian crust, question mark. The granite gneisses and the basaltic amphibolites were subduction generated magmas associated with an active convergent continental volcanic arc setting. So, where do we go from there? Well, we could leave it at that and be safe, or we could try to tie it into a kind of more, shall we say, global picture. This is a great diagram from Dave Foster's 2006 paper where he shows the various basement rock occurrences throughout the West, and particularly the Pacific Northwest, with the classic Wyoming craton and the Medicine Hat Block and the Hearn Craton in the north, separated by the infamous Great Falls Tectonic Zone, which has the Little Belt um, arc in it, and the presumed Vulcan Zone, which is not exposed to the north. But these are the ages uh, for these major cratonic blocks. The two we've just talked about here with Priest River to the north, and the clear water to the south appear to have this bimodal age relationship of 2.6 billion year old Archean ages and 1.86 billion year old Paleoproterozoic. But we have some interesting things within them, the 1.58 Augenice, and in the south, the 1.79 Bulls Butte Anorthosite. But we now have a pretty significant chunk of change here that's 125 miles in, uh, in, in strike. And some have been tempted to try to say, oh, well, this is just an extension of the Medicine Hat block or possibly an extension of the Hearn Craton. But in Jeff Revort's 2015 paper, which I highly recommend, he proposes a totally new separate block, which he calls the Clearwater block. And he makes the argument that this particular block of rocks has this very defined bimodal age relationship. And he kind of leaves it at that and, and for the rest of us to kind of think about. But he makes a lot of other arguments why it's not part of the medicine hat. Um, the Medicine Hat, I don't believe, has any 2.6 billion. No, it has no 1.86 billion year old rocks. Um, it's probably not related to the Little Belt uh, arc down in here, which has 1.85 billion year old rocks. So he's he he proposed this idea of a, a new block called the Clearwater block. So that's kind of leading into the third part of the talk, and that is this concept of supercontinents and the relationship these rocks have with pre-Pangaea supercontinents, particularly the one known as Columbia or as some call it Nuna, because the ages, particularly for the orthonices and the amphibolites, sit right dead smack in the middle of the age range when there was global orogenic activity worldwide that the Columbia supercontinent has kind of been proposed upon. So here are the major you know, supercontinents of the past. 
The diagram below shows global detrital zircons, and it shows these major peaks, which represent orogenic periods. So we're going to talk about this period here that was associated with the assembly, the coming together of supercontinent Columbia, and what might have been our neighbor to the west during this very active time of orogenesis between 2 billion and 1.6 billion. 1.6 billion is, by the way, the time of maximum packing for supercontinent Columbia. So if you're not real um, up to date on supercontinent terminology, this is out of a neat paper by Mir 2012. And he defines the supercontinent as one that should have approximately 75% of Earth's preserved continental crust relative to the time of maximum packing. For example, Pangea had something like, what was it, 80 to 90% of the continental crust together during the time of maximum pa packing during the end of the Paleozoic. So how do they know which rocks, which crustal blocks are connected and when, you know, the who was where and when? And how do they make these crazy reconstructions? Well, they look at rock types and even more importantly, associations. Do we see rocks associated with orogenic activity, suggesting crustal blocks coming together? Or are we looking at associations of rifting when the crustal blocks were moving apart? They utilize zircon crystallization ages, obviously, along with the isotope chemistry from zircons, the so-called epsilon hafnium values and so forth. They look at detrital zircons like Steve did when he presented his work on the Deer Trail and the lower belt. They use paleomagnetism or some people like to call it paleomagic and for uh, Pangea of course paleontological data but for the rocks we're working on and looking at of course we don't really have much evidence for any significant life at that time. If you want to get caught up particularly students, this is a great book, Continents and Supercontinents uh, by Rogers and Santosh. It goes over this in detail. So there have been many reconstructions since this initial one by Rogers and Santosh around 2002. And here's our reconstruction with ancient North America, Laurentia. Now, you kind of got to get used to the way they orient these things. Keep in mind, this is basically the Hudson Bay area. This is Canada, here's the south, and I'm going to try to point out where the Priest River and uh, Clearwater complexes were at that time. So here's what Rogers and Santosh interpreted for 1.5 billion, based primarily on reconstructing zones of orogenic activity. Uh, notice they have Antarctica penciled in here, but not exactly sure with India out of that and Australia far north and Siberia very far north. This came out basically about the same time as the Rogers and Santosh. This is by Zhao. And this is kind of the precursor or proto-sweat hypothesis. Again, here's North America, Laurentia, Hudson Bay, southern U.S. Here's our Priest River complex. So notice they put East Antarctica right up pretty close to Western Laurentia with Australia just to the north of that and Siberia way to the north like Rogers and Santosh with India far outboard of that. Again, this is kind of a proto-sweat model. Sweat was the model that Eldridge Moores proposed in the 90s for Rodinia. This was uh, a Sears and Price model in 2003. They put Siberia right next to us here in the Pacific Northwest in Western Laurentia. And here's another alternative model by Howe and uh, Huo in 2008. And instead of having Antarctica in there, they scooch India right up close with North China, East Antarctica far to the north, Australia even farther to the north, and Siberia to the north. They base this on trying to tie together orogenic zones, but particularly radiating dike swarms, suggesting 
these were together upon breakup. And then more recently, 2011, Zhang and others. Look at the one down below. Okay, here's Western Laurentia. Here's our southern part of Laurentia. Here is our part of the world. They put East Antarctica out here. And then they put this pesky little piece of continental crust known as Cath Asia in between with Australia to the north. So numerous models. This was a summary by Merton Santosh in 2017 based exclusively on paleomagnetic data, high quality paleomagnetic data. Because there isn't any from Antarctica, they left it out. They also left out Cath Asia because uh, the data wasn't confirmed at that point. But notice they put Australia pretty far to the north and Canada and Siberia way far to the north. So which one is? It? Well, last year in the spring, this is what we got to hear about from Steve Box. And he placed the East Antarctica, Southern Australia, Mawson continent, so-called Mawson continent, right up next to Laurentia, which, you know, is, is pretty neat. It's, it's kind of a uh, on that proto-sweat theme. And he made his arguments looking at detrital zircons. So the Galler, con, uh, the Galler Craton of Southern Australia tied together with East Antarctica, known as the Mawson Continent. Here we are right adjacent to the belt. So what I want to do is I want to focus for the rest on East Antarctica and specifically the area around the Transantarctic Mountains because a really neat study came out by Gooch and others in 2017, where they looked at glacial clasts in glacial moraines that were adjacent to outlet glaciers coming off the massive Bird Glacier in East Antarctica. These are their sampling sites. We're going to focus on this one known as the Lone Wolf Nunatak site. This is the paper. It's in Precambrian Research. I highly recommend it. Our old friends Fisher and Vervoort were part of it as well. So here's a subglacial topography map of the area we're going to focus on. Dome A and the subglacial mountains, a name that I cannot pronounce. We're going to focus on this area down in here. Okay. Again, for those of you that are geographically a little lost, we're within the Transantarctic Mountains of East Antarctica. Here's a glacial velocity map showing the velocity of the massive Bird Glacier as well as its outlet glaciers. And so you can see that the moraines in this part of the Transantarctic Mountain are potentially going to have rocks, glacial erratics, that could have originated far into the interior of East Antarctica. So we're getting a proxy, we're getting potential sampling of buried Precambrian crust from the interior of East Antarctica. Pretty cool. Here are the sample sites, okay, and these are the ages for the five different sample groups that Gooch identified, Gooch identified, uh, there are some bedrock exposures in the Nimrod complex that are Proterozoic, but none that directly match to the glacial erratics. And again, here is the area we're going to focus on, the Lone Wolf Nunatak site glacial moraine. Here's what it looks like. They landed in helicopters, sample, sampled uh, potential uh, granitic Clasts, read the paper for their sampling techniques and strategy, but pretty darn neat. We did a poster last year at GSA Phoenix, and we compared the orthonices at Cougar Gulch with the rocks that they sampled in East Antarctica. By the way, that 2000. 17 paper compares rocks from the Clearwater 
to these rocks. And the results are pretty much the same. Here's comparing the age data, the uh, zircon age data, and the initial epsilon hafnium geochemistry from the zircons. Nice overlap in ages, okay, from 1.85 up to 1.87, with nice overlaps in the epsilon hafnium uh, isotope data, suggesting similar potential sources. Here's one of the geochem diagrams, a rare earth diagram. The reds are the uh, East Antarctic erratics. The blues are the Cougar Gulch. The blacks are the Kid Creek. And the gray are the Priest River amphibolite inclusion. So the chemistry matches quite nicely as well. So do the uh, tectonic discrimination diagrams plotting within the volcanic arc granite field. So it looks like we have a very good potential match with the granitic orthonices from Priest River as well as from the Clearwater to these 1.85, 1.86 orthonices in the East Antarctic uh, glacial moraines. But if it were only that simple, there are also 1.85 igneous rocks that are quite similar to both the Priest River and East Antarctica up on the Galler Cratons. So what's going on? Um, not sure. One thing is for sure, these Priest River rocks occur adjacent to the Proterozoic Rift Margin, as do the Transantarctic rocks. Okay, so that's a nice match. There are other important matches as well that uh, Gooch presents, but I just want to summarize the PRC rocks with the East Antarctic rocks. They're both occurring next to their Proterozoic rifted margins. They have similar rock types, overlapping geochemistries, overlapping uranium lead crystallization ages, as well as isotope compositions for their zircons. And they both show a definitive active margin convergence uh, arc type assemblage that likely occurred during the assembly of supercontinent Columbia. Other linkages that they propose in the 2017 paper, granitic cobbles dating 1790 match well with Yavapai province rocks in the south. Uh, the 1570 age, which is our Laclede Augenice, they found a cobble of that in East Antarctica. There's a bunch of 1450 Rapa and A-type granites that correlate well with the Laurentian granitic province that ends at the rift margin. And there are Grenville age overprints, which I won't get into here. So when we look at the plot of ages and epsilon hafnium, notice these nice groupings. Here is the 1570 Laclede with both uh, Laclede down here and with East Antarctica, as well as those in the Gawler. And here are our 1.86 orthonices from the Clearwater and Priest River and the um, clasts from East Antarctica, as well as the other age date correlations. So it's not just hanging the hat on one rock and one age date. It's looking at many, and there's a lot of nice, sim, uh, nice meaning N-I-C-E, -N nice uh, similarities and potential linkages. So here's the map that they presented in the 2017 paper, a very large area of proterozoic crustal association. What's going on? Well, we don't know because all of this area is covered by ice. And I guess one possibility is these guys here in the Pacific Northwest 
are related to a continuation of a 1.86 uh, billion year old arc that goes from the south in East Antarctica all the way up to the Galler. That's one possibility. One neat thing, though, is that there's this continuation of the A-type Rapakivi granites all the way into East Antarctica. You do not see those rocks in Australia. So this linkage seems pretty good, but, you know, there's still a lot of questions. And going back to Steve's paper, because... It shows a linkage that I think is, is looking pretty good because he used detrital zircons in the belt as well as up in the deer trail. And so, again, a lot of interesting, interesting similarities. Was East Antarctica definitively our neighbor during the assembly of Columbia? I think there's more questions at this point then there are answers, but I think there's an amassing uh, amount of data that's at least supporting the concept pretty well. So that's all I've got. I'm looking off to the east past Mount Spokane, searching for East, east Antarctica there. I don't think uh, I'm gonna find it today, but thanks a lot. Yeah. Woo very good, very good, very good. Um, so we had, yeah, we had over 50 people showed up and I apologize I didn't say beforehand uh, to save your questions to the end, but you could have asked the whole time. Um, we had one question from Ben Henderson, a good economic geologist extraordinaire. Um, does this, some of this history affect um, the formation of the belt basin? I mean, it seems. Uh, well. Or how does it affect the basin? I mean. That's a great question. I mean, the oldest sediments in the belt are about 1.45. Uh, I'm going to go back to Steve's paper. Um, these are 1.45 to 1.48. Okay. So uh, I would say the Mawson continent, East, East Antarctica, was connected by then and possibly beginning to rift, thus creating a basin, but still connected. And I'll let Steve address that if he's in the crowd. Uh, he, he, might be able to address that better. He talked about it in his talk last spring, but um, it would have been late, if not after the, the assembly. Cool. Um, yeah, Steve would like to talk. We can, um, for sure. I can unmute you there, Steve, if you want to join in, um, the wonderful Dr. Box. Besides that, the comments are all just, wow, Andy, that's great. I, it's nice to see these talks that are just solely focused on, like, field data. I mean, it's actual data that you collected. Um, and I have to look at that, that Google paper, the Googe. Yeah. Googe. yeah. Googe. It's a great yeah. paper. Yeah. Check yeah. it out. But I got to say that all that isotope work was done by Da during his master's work down at WSU. So, I mean, it was a, it was, you know, this is a lot of work by a lot of different people, but yeah, there was field work. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Field work. Yeah. <laughs> It still happens. So I guess one of my questions it would be, when you're looking at the trace elements, um, how much do you think that represents the primary structure, like the primary granite versus, I mean, because at, at Cougar Gulch, I mean, there was, there's boudins that are just stretched out and, and just deformed. So are you asking me, um, for example, with the uh, trace element spider plot, are we really looking at the primary magmatic fingerprint or are we looking at an inherited potentially inherited fingerprint. Yeah, somehow it altered, yeah. In other words, did those did those Cougar Gulch granites pick up the niobium or the uh, tantalum uh, niobium fingerprint well, they, and all that by partial melting? Well, interestingly enough, um, you know, the 2.65 billion year old Ponderay Nice has a similar kind of signature. And when you partially melt, you're going to have a higher overall trend of those elements, but maybe retain that. So yes, that is a possibility. I guess my argument would be, and, and that's why you can't hang your hat on one diagram. You have to look at a lot of diagrams and relationships. I guess my argument would be, and this is where we'd have to bring in the isotope gurus, um, Da was pretty convinced that 
the the melts that generated the orthonysis originated from a partially depleted mantle wedge along with a moderate amount of lower crustal, continental crustal material. So that would not be unusual. Um, there's, I think that the consistency of the data and the isotope data kind of favors an arc type setting. Yeah, it's hard to argue that half me on zircon data. I mean, that's beautiful, yeah. Yeah. Very neat. Okay, so Steve Box is asking, Steve, would you like to talk? Can I unmute you, Steve? Can, can I mention one more thing before uh, Steve takes over? We oh. did an age date on a uh, late or a Cretaceous age banded nice up near Mount Spokane, and we got an inherited zircon of 1580, suggesting that there may be more Laclede Augen nice underneath us than the two slivers up by Priest. River. So that's kind of a cool concept that the, the underlying basement is more complex than we know about at this point, which is probably no surprise. Go go ahead, Steve. All right, Steve. So I'm ask to unmute. Can you hear me? Hey, Steve, how's it going? Good. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Good. Um, I heard my name. I was trying to type a question and Andy asked me something, but I don't know what he did when I was asking, typing a question about the age, asking him, how did he get the age of the Razorback? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I should have probably made it clear that we really don't know the age. Our guess, our best guess is somewhere between 1.6 and 1.7, question mark. But I mean, it has to be less than 1.7 because, or 1.7, or I can't remember what the uh, minimum age was at 1.73. It's got to be less than that if if our minimum zircon age is 1.73. So uh -huh. we're guessing 1.6 to 1.7. And we would argue an unconformity between that and the overlying Hauser Lake. Yeah, great. Um, do you recall what you were asking uh, when you first put up this diagram that's still on the screen? Yeah, um, somebody asked the question, what was the involvement of the belt during this time period? And I threw up your diagram and said, well, Steve can answer that. <laughs> well, the, the belt certainly records um, the the sor the 1.58 source coming from the west, um, the the stuff from the Gawler or any of those ones shown on the map that are 1.58, and what we took to be the kind of pinning um, um, for for this model of how um, East Antarctica, Australia fits against North America is the way up in Canada there that PR1 basin. It has a, a a pretty um, unimodal source of 1.5 um, billion um, zircons that uh, are only known to come from Mount Isa in uh, northeastern Australia. So uh, the Canadians made that case that it was a, a pretty tight tie. And when you put it together, it, it, uh, it, it fits about as we show it on this diagram. So that, that puts kind of East Antarctica directly against um, um, Belt Purcell there. Uh, I think in this diagram, perhaps the, the Trans-Antarctic Mountains 1580 MA uh, was the, the Guge area you were talking about. So that comes out close to, to where we are too now. And I should also put in, Steve, the Paleo Mag seems to agree with this also. It puts nor, uh, Northern Australia pretty far to the north, uh, mm -hmm. uh, adjacent to Canada, which, so there's, you know, data that goes along with it. Whether you believe Paleo Mag or not, uh, but it's just another the stars, the stars are lining up, it looks like. Yeah. How we're going to deal with that Calf Asia uh, thing is, well, maybe that'll be another talk another time. 
Steve, were you going to ask me something? I was going to ask you something about the uh, um, uh, those those one point seven rocks in the Clearwater, the uh, the anorthosite. Anorthosites, right? Yeah, um, that's that's really interesting. The Bulls Butte anorthosite. Um, when Anna Heitenden worked on it back in the '60s and '70s. She questioned whether or not they were primary magmas or whether they were metasomatic of some kind. But uh, Dowdy and Chamberlain dated it. And uh, in their paper, Chamberlain is very clear that the zircons they extracted from the Bulls Butte and Orthocyte are definitely magmatic. So that is a magmatic age. That is an anorthocyte complex, if you wish. Mm -hmm. And there was a group out of Los Alamos that explained the weird aluminosilicates down there by um, hydrothermal alteration, which is cool because it keeps the idea that that anorthosite is primary magmatic with a slightly younger age than the Cougar Gulch rocks at 1.78, 1.79. Interestingly enough, there is spatterings of anorthosite down through the bitterroots. They haven't been dated, but they have similar hosts and they have similar pattern uh, um, fabrics and mineralogies as the Bulls Butte. So there may be an anorthosite complex or suite, which is really important in supercontinent kind of ideas because um, there was a paper out of um, the Cheyenne Belt where they argued that there's an anorthosite complex down there that is slightly younger than some paleoproterozoic arc rocks down there. And they argue that that was a post arc rifting or back arc rifting event, which evidently has been documented with numerous um, anorthosite complexes in other parts of the world. So the anorthosite at Bulls Butte, and this is a huge arm-waving stretch at the Northwest Mining Meeting. They used to call it a left lateral leap. But maybe the anorthosite represents a back arc rift to the Cougar Gulch arc itself, Cougar, or, you know, Priest River, Clearwater arc. And this is slightly back arc and slightly after. Huge, huge jump. We don't know, but if that were true, it would give us some idea for the polarity of the arc, which might help in kind of reconstructing these further. Are there any anorthosites in, uh, known in Antarctica? Not that I'm aware of. I uh, emailed um, John and asked him, and I haven't heard back from him yet. Maybe you better get out there, Andy, and and <laughs> look for him. Well, I'm just waiting for global warming to really kick in. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to have to hang out on those glaciers collecting cobbles. <laughs> and maybe after November third, it really will kick in. Who knows? <laughs> That's my only political joke. I, I did notice a left lateral joke there. Yeah, so um, yeah, that's good. So we're getting at 712. We're losing a couple of people. I just want to put in a little quick um, plug here that Steve Box's paper in 2020 had student researchers in there, and Andy works with wonderful students as well. Um, if you do have extra um, funds at this time, please feel free to donate to your local geology program. SCC, I'm sure, would take donations as well as Eastern uh, or other schools if you're from another place. Um, we had one more question here as well from Ben Henderson again, Silver Valley. Woo! Um, what kind of evidence do you see for the younger, the Lewis and Clark tectonic zone coming through there? Did you see any of that at all? You're pretty solid. No, right? it's, it's completely truncated by the Purcell trench fault and, and by the uh, core complex itself. So it, it seems to be pretty clear that it was done and finished by 
uh, Eocene time by four, 47 million years ago during unroofing of the core complex because it's completely truncated. Oh, okay. Very cool. Now, whether or not it continues on the other side off to Western Washington. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's a whole nother. That's a fun one. Um, so, yes, I just thank you to Andy. I don't see any more questions, but if you do, feel free to, to, to put them on the chat. Um, our next talk is going to kind of deviate again. Um, we deviated this Tuesday for GSA Connects, the online uh, get together, the national meeting. Um, and then our next talk deviates again to the 17th because of Thanksgiving uh, and, and Native American holidays. Um, so we will meet on the 17th with Sean Long, who teaches at WSU. He's going to talk about some of his sort of wonderful research. I mean, I've seen him talk at GSA. These invited talks are amazing um, for the basin range and how it started to form. Uh, but again, big thanks to Andy and thank you for, for coming tonight. Um, it was a great talk, Andy. I really appreciated that. And we'll look thank forward to some more. All right. Everybody have a good night and thanks for showing up.